You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. So good afternoon to most of you, although it's good morning to at least one of our participants and perhaps to others in the audience who may be logged in from other parts of the world. Welcome to our second seminar on the topic of decolonization, cultures and communities. The first version, the first uh, one, was took place a couple of weeks ago and has been recorded and is available on the uh, International Network for Criminal Justice website. Uh, I'm Rob Canton. I work at De Montfort University in Leicester. I shall be facilitating today. We've been hoping that today's facilitator would be our colleague Kashika Patel, but she's unable to participate today. And those of us who know her know that she would not have withdrawn unless the reasons were urgent and extremely important. <clears throat> it's my privilege to introduce the participants. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with all of them in the past, and I'll say a bit more about them when their time comes. But for now, <clears throat> Dennis Bracken, Professor Emeritus from the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Professor John Don, Don John O'Malley uh, is at the Federal University at Wukari Taraba State in Nigeria. And our third presenter is Juliana Kabunaru. Juliana works closely with another friend of ours, Jon Donescu, who is unable to join us today. And Juliana very kindly stepped in at short note to notice to replace him. On the panel, we have Abdul Hai Mir, who is a lecturer in policing at De Montfort. He's also a highly respected member of the London Policing Ethics Panel. And finally, Dave Ward, professor at De Montfort, who many of you will know as one of the founder members of this network. As I've remarked, this is the second seminar on this topic. And so many astute and insightful remarks were made at the first seminar that it would be unwise to try to attempt to, uh, to summarize. But there are two or three things I would like to say at this stage, things that I took from the first event. So first of all, it was very clear that an approach to criminal justice that neglects other perspectives than the dominant Northwestern traditions diminishes the quality of teaching and scholarship but it also has profound consequences for practice. And notably, Professor Brian Stout spoke with passion about the scandalous overrepresentation of indigenous Australians in the criminal justice system. Second, as we critique present understandings and practices, there must be space for others to put forward their own perceptions of what the problems are and what would counter solutions to them. Otherwise, there's a risk that decolonization just becomes another act of colonization. And thirdly, it's not only that other ways of thinking have been neglected, but that they are suppressed. Western traditions bring their own strengths, but other perspectives must be given expression. Insights from different cultures should be used in complement, and it's the dominance of colonization that must be rejected. So that's what I want to say by introduction. When, as, as, as this proceeds, uh, those of you who are attending on YouTube can have an opportunity, if you take it, please, to type in uh, any comments or questions, and those will be uh, picked up and addressed by the presenters and the panel at particular moments. So I'm going to begin now, if I may, by introducing our first speaker. This is Professor Dennis Bracken, Emeritus Professor at the Faculty of Social Work in Manitoba a friend for many years who spent a year working at De Montfort as a visitor, during which time he was uh, an active contributor to the probation training program here. It's always a pleasure to work with you, Dennis, and thank you in advance for your participation today. Uh, may I pass the floor to you now, please? Thanks. I'm just going to share my screen, if I may. I'm assuming people can see that. Um, and I'll just go to my slideshow. Hang on just a minute. There, I think that's good. I'm, I'm assuming people can see that. So thanks very much. Um, I'd like to begin, hang on, I just need to adjust something here. I'm sorry, I'm used to using Microsoft Teams. That's better. Um, so 
most of us in in academia and in um, the public sector always begin by acknowledging where we are. And so I would like to do that now. The city of Winnipeg sits at the crossroads of, of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. I acknowledge my location on Treaty 1 territory, which is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people and the homeland of the Métis nation. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the patience shown by my various Indigenous colleagues and students as they educated me, a white man of privilege from suburban Eastern United States, about Indigenous culture and traditions, and as someone who has made his home on their territory for the past 48 years. A little bit about um, um, terminology. The term Aboriginal peoples refers to the indigenous inhabitants of Canada and has been used to refer in a general manner to Inuit and to First Nations and Métis people without regard to their separate origins or, or identities. However, the use of the term indigenous peoples is widely seen as the proper way to represent the peoples, the first peoples of North America. And that's what I'm going to do in this presentation. Although in reference either to historical usage or legal documents, you may, I may use the word Aboriginal because that is how it appears in, in the Canadian constitution and in other official um, sort of documentation. I should also explain a little bit. I've, I've mentioned the, the peoples, including the Métis people. And the Métis people are a distinct um, indigenous group who are uh, the um, descendants, if you will, of the initial European um, colonizers as they moved across North America, um, largely of French or French Canadian background. Um, and they intermingled and married um, mostly Cree uh, women. And the result was a very distinctive culture that emerged on the Canadian prairies and to a lesser extent in the American states of North Dakota and Montana. But they are recognized in Canada as a distinct group. They have a distinct culture, a distinct language, which is a mixture of sort of 18th century French and Cree. Um, they also are overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, which um, reflects their, their French ancestry. Um, but they are considered, as I said, uh, to be um, one of the first peoples of Canada. I also mentioned the Inuit. The Inuit people are the people of the far north. Um, they were initially labeled as Eskimos um, by the Europeans when they first encountered them. But that's not a term that they use. Um, to, to uh, distinguish themselves. And so it's a term that is generally not used um, at all in Canada. And as part of the, um, the gradual reclamation of their language and the elimination of um, pejorative terms, um, the word Eskimo is no longer used. And for example, the um, Canadian Football League's Edmonton team was known until about two months ago as the Edmonton Eskimos, and they have um, removed uh, the word Eskimo from, from their language, uh, sorry, from their, their team uh, designation. Anyway, let me move on and tell you what it is that I'm, I'm hoping to do um, in, the, in this presentation. Whoops, sorry, for some reason my, um, there it goes. So, First, I want to show what the data demonstrates with respect to the involvement of Indigenous people in criminal justice. Um, Rob made a, a reference to Brian Stout's uh, presentation, which I had the opportunity to listen to. And um, Canada is in no better position than Australia with respect to Indigenous people in criminal justice. I'll then look at, uh, briefly at, at some recent history. And by recent history, I mean the last 25 or 30 years, as the issue of Aboriginal over-representation uh, came to the fore. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Also look at some contemporary issues, things that are happening more or less right now. There's major concern about indigenous deaths at the hands of the police. Um, that's been going on for some time, but the, 
the American Black Lives Matter and uh, the murder of George Floyd uh, just south of us here in, in Manitoba, down in Minnesota, um, has brought that um, uh, to some necessary attention, I think. And also the legacy of the residential schools and a very specific um, situation that has arisen again in the last six to eight weeks. I'll then talk about colonization as a process. And then I will give you one example of uh, attempts. And, and I wanna uh, underscore the, the word attempt. I, I would be hesitant to say a successful attempt, but an attempt num nonetheless at decolonization uh, when it comes to criminal sentencing. And that's something known as Gladue reports. And I will explain that as we go along. Oops, sorry. So what about the indigenous peoples of Canada and their experience of the criminal justice system? Well, they account for 4% of the Canadian population, but about 30%, 37% of the national population of those in adult custody. Now, just to be clear, um, in Canada, we have a split jurisdiction system with respect to imprisonment. Um, we have a federal system as well as each province has their own system. Um, I won't get into the details of that. They go back to Victorian um, uh, Canada. But, but the point is that 37% of the custodial population um, across the country is Indigenous while making up 4% of the Canadian population. On the provincial level, in other words, in the province of Manitoba, Indigenous people make up about 16% of the Manitoba population. So Manitoba has one of the largest Indigenous populations as a percentage of any province, but they make up 75% of the population in adult correctional custody. So you can see that overrepresentation is significant to say the least. And indigenous custody rates have increased across the country since the year 2000. So you'll see when I, when I go back and go over those various royal commissions and things like that, while all those things were going on, the number of indigenous people in custody has actually increased. And if we look at federal, uh, sorry, female adult offenders alone in the province of Manitoba, 90% of the females in sentence custody or on remand in Manitoba are indigenous women. So there's a gender aspect to um, the overrepresentation as well. Um, now, another problem with this bifurcated system is that it's very difficult to get national data that, that, um, that shows uh, issues around uh, custody, for example. But this is from a study that was done by the Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice five years ago. And you'll see that um, the, there was a small change of 3.5% in uh, indigenous men in custody between 2006 and 2016. But if you look, the rate of, of um, this is federal only, this is not provincial, federal only custody was 674, 684, 651 per 100,000. If you were doing that in a league table comparing other countries, we'd be right up there with the United States, right? You'll also see that indigenous custody of indigenous women, again, at the federal level only, has increased 16%. You can see that non-indigenous women, that in, the, has increased 32%. So there's something going on with respect to uh, incarceration of women generally, but also indigenous women in particular. Uh, and then you'll see the, the sort of raw numbers um, uh, in, in table number two. I, I, I don't want to just sort of bore you with too much information, but I think that's I think that actually gives you some indication. Sorry, something's going on there. There we go. If we look just at, at provincial data, and again, this is this is the result of uh, data mining, if you will, trying to read annual reports of correctional facilities and things like that. Basically, if you look at at Saskatchewan, which is the province just west of Manitoba, uh, Yukon, which is uh, considered not a province but a territory, which is north of British Columbia, and those of you good on North American geography, it's right next to Alaska. Then you have Manitoba, and then you have Alberta which is two provinces to the west of us. 
Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta are considered the prairie provinces of Canada. So you see in, in 1978-79, admissions to Indigenous admissions to custody in Saskatchewan amounted to 61% of all admissions. And by um, just three years ago, it was up to 74%. In the Yukon, it moved from 51 to 62. In Manitoba, it went from 50% to 75% admissions to custody of Indigenous people, and Alberta from 26 to 41 percent. So you can see the numbers are definitely going, if I may be so bold to say, in the wrong direction. And the incarceration of Indigenous people continues to increase both at the provincial and at the federal level. Oops. If we looked just very briefly at youth, and uh, I want to be clear, youth, um, the youth justice system in Canada is, is, is provincial only. There is no federal youth justice system. It's all done at the provincial level. So in 2018, Indigenous youth, indigenous youth represented 8.8% of the uh, young person population in Canada. And by the way, uh, under 12s, um, criminal involvement of under 12s is dealt with through the child protection system. So the youth justice system in Canada deals with young people from ages 12 to 18. Indigenous youth are vastly overrepresented in both custody and in community supervision. 47% of custody admissions um, and 40% of community sanctioned admissions in 2018-2019 uh, were Indigenous. And remember, they make up just under 9% of the population. So both the adult system and the youth system is, um, is essentially a system for warehousing Indigenous people. So if we just look briefly at, at some recent history, there were two major provincial inquiries, one in Nova Scotia in 1981, 1989, sorry, and one in Manitoba in 1991. And these inquiries looked at systemic racism in the legal systems that resulted in wrongful prosecutions, police use of violence, failure to prosecute crimes against indigenous people, and over-incarceration. They were both very, very comprehensive um, inquiries. In the case of the one in Nova Scotia, it was triggered by the admission by a man that he had murdered another man in a park in Halifax and had never been prosecuted, but an Indigenous man who happened to be in the area at the time was prosecuted and was given a life sentence. As a result of the inquiry, he was, he was freed. Um, in 1991, the Manitoba inquiry, what was then called the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, was triggered both by the um, murder of uh, an Indigenous chief by an off-duty policeman. The off-duty policeman was intoxicated. Um, there was a scuffle, a gun was drawn, and the, um, the chief was, was killed. And also, another failure to prosecute um, an indigenous woman in a town in northern Manitoba had been um, essentially kidnapped as she was walking along the highway by two uh, young men, um, taken into the bush, um, sexually assaulted, and then murdered. And it was well known in that community who did it, but no one was prosecuted. The, the offense occurred in the 1970s. However, as a result of the inquiry in 1991, uh, prosecutions and convictions were, were found. Um, there was a, a big Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1996. Uh, just reading from the terms of reference, the, it was to consider the evolution of the relationship among Aboriginal peoples, the Canadian government and Canadian society as a whole. It should propose specific solutions rooted in domestic and international experience to the problems which have plagued those relationships which confront Aboriginal peoples today. So that was in 1996. That was 25 years ago. Issues related to criminal justice were very prominent in the final report. And just to go back to my data, the number of, um, of people incarcerated uh, in Canada during the time of the Royal Commission and afterwards has continued to increase. In 2008, there was a national apology on behalf of all Canadians um, by the federal government for the Indian residential school system. Um, that was a system that was in process between the 1880s and the last residential school, I think, closed in about 1996. Uh, indigenous children were taken from their uh, families and put into these school systems. 
Um, the schools were largely run by religious organizations. The Roman Catholic Church um, ran about 50 or 60 percent of them. Uh, other religious uh, Christian denominations ran the rest. Um, uh, children were um, taught to reject their indigenous heritage. They were forbidden from speaking their language. Uh, there's widespread sexual abuse. Uh, those of you who follow um, Ireland, there was very similar things to the mother and baby homes um, in, 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 in Ireland, uh, some of which has just come out uh, in the last few years. Um, so that led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015. And that was to look specifically at the impact of the residential school system that existed from the 1880s to the 1990s. It came up with 94 specific calls for action um, and, um, and also a, a national apology was, was requested. Um, and then lastly, but, but equally important, was a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which reported in uh, 2019. This was set up to examine the failure of the justice system, especially the police, to protect and take seriously crimes against Indigenous women. Uh, the number of, of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls from, I'd say, about the 1970s um, up to at least 2019 is anywhere between 3,500 and 5,000. Um, these are unsolved um, mysteries or, or murders. Um, the police um, basically did very little uh, to investigate these. Um, and so this, this uh, national inquiry was set up and, and issued a report in 2019. And just, um, just to round this out, in the, in the past two months, as I've said, there's been a major national discussion on indigenous issues after the discovery of the unmarked graves of 215 indigenous children on the grounds of a former residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. And, and that specifically is what uh, triggered in my mind the, the um, mother and baby homes um, issue in Ireland. And some of you may be familiar with the, the finding of a mass grave in Chewham um, in Galway. Um, in this particular case, um, this was not a mass grave, but these were simply unmarked graves. No record of who the children were, no record of who their, um, their parents, whether or not their parents were notified. And it has now sparked a major, major discussion across the country about um, the whole Canadian approach to um, Indigenous peoples. I, I think for the, for the this this is long, long overdue. And all of these other royal commissions and inquiries really haven't sparked things quite the way this one has. So let's talk briefly then. Sorry, I think I've jumped ahead by two. Yes. No, sorry. OK, let's talk a little bit about colonization as a process. I use this particular heuristic device of dividing uh, colonialism into two different um, aspects, structural and, and cultural. I'm not suggesting this is the best way to do it or the only way to do it. I have personally have found this helpful. Um, it was uh, something that was developed actually in the 1980s um, by a Canadian non-indigenous uh, indigenous academic, um, but I, I personally find it helpful. So structural colonialism, the complete domination of one group by another, and the exercise of power through formal institutional arrangements. And some examples of that in the Canadian context include the treaties, which were signed between initially the British government and then later the Canadian uh, government with um, indigenous groups. Um, something called the Indian Act, which is the piece of legislation that governs a portion of the indigenous people of Canada. Um, coming out of the Indian Act, the reserve, um, the Americans use the word reservation, Canada uses the word reserve, um, but that's uh, part of the system. Um, formal structures of society, law and the legal system, government, the demarcation of geographic boundaries, et cetera, et cetera, right? Cultural colonialism, the denigration of the customs, values, and mores of the colonized, and the deliberate replacement of them by the conventions and values of the colonizers. So um, things such as the resident school system designed to facilitate assimilation, um, the um, apprehension of 
um, indigenous children from their parents by child protection authorities, the outlawing of traditional language and cultural practices, etc. cetera. Um, and it is a process. It's not something that happened and now we're living with the after effects. It's an ongoing uh, process. So what then is decolonization? Well, Again, from this particular perspective, much of the discussion on decolonization, especially as it applies to criminal justice, has focused on aspects of cultural colonialism. So the emerging recognition of the formal attempts at cultural destruction, some argue cultural genocide is a more appropriate term, and the need for acceptance of responsibility is a first step um, towards reconciliation. So the hiring of indigenous uh, people to work in the justice system, um, in, in the police, in the courts, um, uh, the uh, recognition that indigenous elders have the sta same status as chaplains in the prison system. Um, all of that is an attempt to, um, to roll back, if you will, the cultural colonial aspects um, to try and recognize the, the strengths of indigenous culture um, and indigenous communities and to use those um, within, uh, within a criminal justice system. Decolonization of the structures of settler colonialism encounters very strong resistance. The legal system, policing, sanctioning systems, child protection systems arguably have not changed. Um, for example, Indigenous um, communities have a form of um, uh, delegated authority over child protection, um, but it's delegated. In other words, it's not an inherited authority based on who they are as a people, as a nation, if you will. It is the uh, structures of colonialism saying, we'll give you the authority, but which we ultimately have. To quote the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report, they said this very directly. The Canadian justice system is premised on settler colonial societies, values, beliefs, laws, and policies. It's a justice system that fails to include Indigenous concepts of justice. Canadian justice system has been imposed on Indigenous peoples and has oppressed and replaced the Indigenous justice systems that served Indigenous communities effectively since time immemorial. So training indigenous social workers, hiring indigenous people as prison officers, establishing tribal police, one might argue could make the various systems more attentive to issues, cultures, traditions, et cetera, of the indigenous people. The question remains as to whether or not that will result in broader systemic change as necessary. And as I say, the decolonization of the structures of colonialism are strongly resisted within Canada. So to give you just one, Example, sorry. One example of a very, very small attempt. Sorry, Rob, I hope I'm not going too long here. Um, but this has to do with sentencing policy and Indigenous peoples. So Canada has in its criminal code principles of sentencing, section 718.2. A court that imposes a sentence shall also take into consideration the following principles, A, B, C, D, E. E says all available sanctions other than imprisonment that are reasonable in the circumstances should be considered for all individuals. And this is my emphasis with particular attention paid to the circumstances of Aboriginal individuals. Now that was an amendment to the Canadian Criminal Code in 1996, right? It was this particular aspect with particular attention paid to the circumstances of Aboriginal individuals was ignored. The justice system ignored it. And so in 1999, uh, a woman named Cindy Gladue, um, who had been convicted, she was an indigenous woman in British Columbia, had been convicted of manslaughter. And her, um, her counsel said that she should appeal based on that section of the criminal code because the judge had not taken into account the particular circumstances of her as an individual woman. And so the Supreme Court in um, R versus Gladue, and then in a subsequent decision, which I'll talk about in a minute, said the courts were to seek out and take account of information related to the historical and contemporary experience of indigenous people when they were coming up with sentencing. 
So specifically in the Gladue decision, courts were directed to consider, quote, the types of sentencing procedures and sanctions, which may be appropriate in the circumstances for the offender because of his or her particular Aboriginal heritage or connection. And also courts should consider whether imprisonment would actually serve to deter or denounce crime in a sense that would be meaningful to the community in which the offender is a member. So the Supreme Court said, hey, you should be doing this. We have a section in the law here and you're not doing it. So in 1999, they issued this directive. It was ignored. In 2012, so another case, this was in Ontario, Ippoli, in which Ippoli was also convicted and went uh, to the Supreme Court. So in 2012, the court said, okay, everybody pay attention. So here's, here's a quote from that decision. To be clear, courts must take judicial notice of such matters as the history of colonialism, displacement, residential schools, and how that history continues to translate into lower educational attainment, lower incomes, higher unemployment, higher rates of, <coughs> excuse me, of substance abuse and suicide, and of course, higher levels of incarceration. These matters on their own do not necessarily justify a different sentence for Aboriginal offenders. Rather, they provide the necessary context for understanding and evaluating the case-specific information presented by counsel. So the question then became, okay, the court has kind of very directly said, listen, boys and girls, you've got to do something here. So they developed, each province now has their own, a thing called the Gladue Report. So Cindy Gladue is now forever remembered in Canadian criminal justice history because we now have reports named after her. They are a form of pre-sentence report. But they, if, if, if defense counsel requests it, the court must order it. And the court then must take it into account at the time of sentencing. Now, these have really only been going on since probably about 2014. There was one study done by, by actually someone that some of you in, in the UK uh, may remember, Philip Stenning, um, who I think is now in Australia. Um, he did, a, in, and a colleague, I can't remember her name, did a review of these to see whether or not they were making a difference in, in sentencing. Um, and and it, their, their result was kind of equivocal. However, the data continues to show that the over-incarceration has not slowed down. So there's a question as to whether or not that's actually worked. Uh, and the other question, of course, is whether or not that has had any impact on um, uh, the structures of the legal system. So in closing, if I can just quote from the call to action number 42 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, this is 42 out of 94. We call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to commit to the recognition and implementation of Aboriginal justice systems in a manner consistent with the treaty and Aboriginal rights of Aboriginal people, the Constitution Act of 1982, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was endorsed by Canada in 2012, but not formally adopted. Although, to be fair, the current federal government has introduced legislation in Canada, uh, in, in the parliament, so that we would formally adopt the um, uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But so far, we haven't. And I will stop there. Dennis, thank you very much indeed. Um, this is a point for the panel, other presenters and panel members to uh, comment on in any way that they might and to ask Dennis questions that they might. And they're also, I don't know, Rob, you can perhaps tell us whether questions are being coming in on the, uh, the from YouTube from other members of the audience. Uh, anybody got a, a particular point they would like to make? I'll start us off then while you think up some good questions. Uh, Dennis, I was um, unsurprisingly reminded as you were talking of Brian Stout's representation. Um, there are many similarities, it seems, between Australia and Canada. But one of the most striking things is Please correct me if I have this wrong, because I'm looking at this very much as an ignorant outsider. But as it seems to me, over the last 30 or 40 years, Australia and Canada have become increasingly aware that they are they have colonized their countries. 
the language in which they refer to their indigenous peoples have become increasingly respectful. They've tried to in, introduce sensibilities and sensitivities. There have been apologies. There have been reconciliation and truth commissions. There have been inquiries. And the upshot of that has been that the position has got worse and worse and worse. So is, is that unfair or does that chime with, uh, with uh, the experience in Canada? And if so, what, what can we learn from that? Well, first of all, I think it's very fair. So you're not being unfair at all. Um, you know, I, I think that, that Brian's presentation and mine, um, sadly, were, were very similar in, in terms of showing what's going on in these two countries. Um, I think it's what is unfair is to expect that the criminal justice system is somehow going to fix or rectify, um, in Canada's case, two centuries of colonization. That's not going, the, the criminal justice system isn't going to do that. It has to be part of a much broader discussion, which I think, you, as you've alluded to, is taking place. But, you know, seriously, how do you, how do you reverse two centuries of colonization? How do you, how do you fix or how do you change um, those structures of the colonial system that have existed and evolved over 200 years and which are now part and parcel of daily life in, in, in Canada. How, how do you, how do you change that? Um, I, I, if you're sitting there with bated breath waiting for me to have an answer, I don't have an answer to those. Um, but, but at least recognition of that um, may be one way in which we begin the process. And certainly the calls to action of the truth and reconciliation um, were, um, where I think of, of the beginnings of the discussion, but this, this very sad situation of the discovery of the 215 um, unmarked graves of, of children in a residential school, or a former residential school, has really captured the, the attention of, um, of the country. How long that lasts, um, how long we're able to focus that into, into real systemic change, I don't know. But I, I do... I do want to say that the, the criminal justice system is a prominent example of the problems, but um, it's not the only example. And there's lots more that's connected to that. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Dave, I see you have an observation. I thought there was um, so much, um, so much information there, um, which was fascinating. Um, uh, Dennis, in terms of uh, setting out the context and the context um, in relation to Indigenous people in Canada, which one can, I think that we can relatively, um, I don't know, easily, cross the wrong word, but one can transfer to thinking about the, uh, the position, the, the relationship um, of um, minority ethnic people uh, in uh, in the UK and, uh, and 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 other countries, and I was particularly I was particularly taken by your um, your, your uh, categorization of um, structural colonialism and cultural colonialism. And um, your suggestion that really the uh, the focus on the um, on uh, the re the focus has been very much on uh, the cultural colonialism, and it reminds me very much of a um, little homily that I heard recently, which suggested that in this context, um, and I'm I'm I'm. Um, um, I'm, I'm joining this seminar from, from Plymouth, um, where we've um, been addressing the um, 200th, uh, the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower in the US. And there has been a, a, a big debate about whether it is something to recognize or, uh, or celebrate. Um, but that, uh, the, the, the little phrase I heard was that it's very easy to, to 
Um, it, it's very easy to celebrate the exotic, but much more difficult to address the problematic. And that, uh, that for me, kind of fits in with your division between uh, cultural colonialism and, and structural colonialism. But I suppose I've got two questions. Um, are, is it possible for these things to operate sequentially? In other words, is, is, is addressing the um, cultural colonialism and making progress in, in that area, which I, I, I think, well, I would assert there is a lot, of, uh, there is a lot to recognize and a lot that we could see. Is that a precursor for um, and, and, and the foundation for addressing structural colonialism? Or is the colonial way of doing things structurally, in your case, the, um, um, in this case, in our, our considerations, the operation of the criminal justice system, so embedded in the majority and the dominant Population um, that um, that was that, that that can can never really be shifted, and I noticed and and shifting it um, seemed to me to involve the the statement in your very last slide from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was about recognizing and implementing. Aboriginal justice system. Mm -hmm. Is that ever possible? Um, Is coexistence okay. possible? First of all, thanks. Thanks for the comments. Um, and let me get to your to your point. Um, optimistically, as a white man of privilege. <clears throat> excuse me, I like to think, yes, it is possible that the more that the rest of Canadian society understands the strengths of Aboriginal culture and not from an exotic perspective, but just from a recognition that we all come from different um, backgrounds and cultural communities that have strengths um, and that, that we should recognize and celebrate those. And that's number one. Number two, that, that we recognize the damage that Canadian society has done to Indigenous peoples. Then optimistically, I like to think that then people will say, well, OK, then maybe we can move along and we can start doing other things and start dismantling some of these colonial structures. If I was an Indigenous person, I might just say, look, um, Multiculturalism, uh, you know, have, having indigenous days and, you know, having people, you know, recognize us in terms of, of our exotic culture <clears throat> isn't enough. And by the way, it's not moving fast enough. So I, I think there's, there's kind of a double edge here. I think that, the, that it would be wrong for me to say to indigenous people, just relax, we'll get there eventually. I don't think that's fair, right? Meanwhile, your people are getting killed, your women are disappearing and, and everybody's going to jail, right? Um, but at the same time, I like, to, I like to think that even in the 48 years where I have lived in Canada, <clears throat> I've seen major changes in terms of recognition of Aboriginal culture, traditions, et cetera. And also as is happening elsewhere, you know, in, I, I remember it made the news here, some statue was taken down in Bristol. Um, Cecil Rhodes is being questioned. Here we are changing the names of streets. We are taking down um, statues and things like that. And all of that I think is, <clears throat> is important to do, but that's not enough. And there needs to be more done than that. If I may just go back to your earlier point about the, <clears throat> the sort of transfer of knowledge and things like that. One of my more recent occupations has been working in, in, in Ireland. And I've done a lot of research on the travelers and um, the, uh, the, the impact that, for example, the 1963 Commission on Itinerancy 
which was to address the quote unquote problems of the traveling community in Ireland. And by the way, they didn't talk to a single traveler while they were doing this big commission. But the, the, the outcome of the commission was assimilation. We need to assimilate the travelers so that they stop being the other. They have to be now us. And that assimilationist approach is exactly what the residential schools were about in Canada and the United States, right? Um, I, I don't want to push the metaphor too, too strongly, but there are issues in terms of how we have dealt with the other. And I'm certainly aware through um, you know, connections with you people about the issues with uh, people in, in, um, in Britain, particularly uh, black and, and other minorities. Dennis, thank you. And thank you for some good questions and comments to spark that. Um, we've time for just one more question before the next presentation. So, Abdul, over to you, please. Yes, thank you. Dennis, thank you very much uh, for such an interesting presentation. I, too, was struck with sort of um, the, the distinctions you made between structural colonialism and cultural colonialism. Um, my background is as a police officer uh, of 30 years before I came into academia. Um, one of the things we've struggled with for the last uh, over two decades was the label in UK, and particularly the police service where I serve, the Metropolitan Police Service, of the label of institutional racism. And, and just yesterday, we were also, the same police force was also labeled by another major inquiry as institutionally corrupt. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the thing I was kind of thinking about and reflecting on as I was listening to you was kind of similar experiences in the UK, but we've just gone through a whole big social turmoil. <laughs> you might have heard of it, Brexit. <laughs> You know, um, it's caused quite a bit of polarization, I dare say, within our communities and, and between, you know, racial on along racial lines as well on occasionally. Um, and I, I was just sort of thinking about that. And we had a recent report um, that was issued by the government, uh, a race and ethnic disparity report, very controversial report. But it was almost a, a kickback in response to Black Lives Matters and decolonizing movements and things like that. And I just wondered whether, from your perspective, you had any observations of how the state kicked back and is trying to kick back with structured colonialism because you said that it, it you know, this is what's offering greater resistance, and it's the same thing that we seem to be experiencing here in the UK. And and if you have kind of experienced this, the same, are there any sort of things you can tell us about the responses to that kickback from uh, those in power, as it were? Does that question or do my questions make sense to you? Thank you. It definitely makes sense. Um, I, I think that, um, that, that Canada's resistance to structural change is very understated. Um, and it's, it's typically, if I may say this, it's typically Canadian. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you, this is a Canadian joke. Um, you know, they say as American as apple pie, the Canadian equivalent is as Canadian as possible given the circumstances. Right. <laughs> so when it comes to sort of a direct, like, hey, we've got to change this, then we'll do a royal commission. You've seen there's been lots of them. We'll do some kind of discussion. There'll be sort of public hand wringing by, by uh, politicians. And then eventually just the hope that this will go away until the next time it comes back. So th the kickback is, is very subtle, right? Uh, but it's definitely there. Um, you know, back, I, I mean, back 30 years ago when the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry was going in Manitoba, we brought the, the inquiry, and I was part of the uh, a small, very small part of the research team of that inquiry. We brought to Manitoba representatives of the American tribal justice systems. Because American tribal, there are tribal courts, tribal judges, uh, tribal lawyers, tribal police, we brought them up and, and had them talk. And they spoke very frankly. And they said, look, we are doing the white man's work, right? We think we do it better than the white man when we're dealing with our people. But our laws are actually the laws of the United States. 
our police powers are delegated, whatever. Okay, so so we took that on board, and the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry um, said, okay, we've got to do things differently here, but we still need an Aboriginal justice system. And interestingly enough, the chair of that, one of the co-chairs of that in just, the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in the 1990s, was also the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2012. Uh, he's an Indigenous man. He was the first Indigenous um, Queen's Bench Court judge. He went on to become a Canadian senator, which is a rough equivalent of the House of Lords. Um, a lot of prestige and no power. Um, and, and he led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and he continues to push for a justice system. But everybody is saying, yes, eventually, eventually, take our time. Sorry, Abdul, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And there's lots of other things I could ask. I was particularly interested in around your assimilation and integration as well, because, you know, I remember growing up um, uh, as a young Bangladeshi in the UK and things like that. That We had that debate around assimilation and integration, right. and it was all about pushing towards assimilation, where, right. you know, kind of not fitting. And we still have this because occasionally there are reports and there are huge concerns by politicians around particular communities who aren't assimilating and who aren't fitting into the community. They are actually fitting into the community. It's just they're not fitting in according to the standards and perspectives of those in power want them right. to fit into. But that's another question. Thank you sure. very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for the question and for the response and, and generally, Dennis, for the discussion that you've sparked. I've taken a, away a number of thoughts and I hope it's not an abuse of the facilitator's position to say that one thing I think we should all need to think harder about is resistance. Mm -hmm. So we speak about we're committed as a university and others are and agencies are committed to uh, decolonization, however that's conceptualized. But who will resist and how? Where will that come from? And will that be passive and inert or will that be active hostility and opposition? So that's something that I, for myself, would, will take away and want to think more about. Um, it's time for our second presentation. And uh, it's my honor to introduce now uh, Professor Don John O'Malley, who's a professor of criminology at the Federal University Wukari Taraba State in Nigeria. Uh, Don John studied for his doctorate at De Montfort, and he wrote an excellent thesis on aspects of restorative justice. I remember it well, and it's splendid to see how his career has flourished since then. So in, in a moment, Don John, I'd like you to take the floor, please. And in giving his presentation, uh, Don John will be assisted by uh, Rob Watson, who will be displaying his slides. So, uh, Don John, when you want uh, the next slide to come up, if you could uh, advise Rob accordingly. So, thank you, and over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you, Rob Watson, for putting the slide up. And I decided to title my uh, presentation, Remoralizing Justice, uh, because I felt that the kind of criminal justice system that we are practicing now, to some extent, and have taken away morality. In, to some extent. I want to begin this by saying that in our criminal justice system here, if offender commits a crime and get a lawyer, the lawyer will find out why the offender committed the crime. And the offender to a very large extent will confess or give confessional statement to the lawyer, tell the lawyer the truth, how the crime occurred. But the lawyer will now tell the, the offender what to say when they got, get to court. And then guide the offender in a way that the offender will now lie and deny responsibility or accountability to, for the offense committed. Because to some extent, these lawyers will say, uh, just 
go by my advice and you will win this case. I have never lost a case and I will not lo uh, lose this case. So go by my advice. So I, some of us who have witnessed this form of um, legal intricacies are beginning to worry. Are we now doing justice or are we now encouraging criminality or wrongdoing among offenders? So that actually is my focus. That's why I titled my presentation, Remoralizing Justice. Next slide, please. Are we there, Rob? Okay. Is it before the coming of the colonial masters to what is today known as Nigeria? Because there was nothing called Nigeria until 1914. What we used to have here by history is that we have a Northern Protectorate and Southern Protectorate operating uh, on their own. They have their own system of doing things, culture and all this stuff until the coming of the colonial masters. The, co the colonial masters actually met this system on ground. And to some extent, after working with the Northern Protectorate and Southern Protectorate for some time, decided in 1914 to merge the two protectorates together and give it a name called Ninja Area. That's where the word Nigeria comes from. And the name was given to us by uh, Lord Lugard, the wife of Lord Lugard. So in 1914, these people of both Southern and Northern Protectorate came together. And um, to be honest, I, I am a Nigerian. The problem that Nigeria is having up to today is because so many Nigerians believe that the coming together of the Southern and Northern Protectorate was a forced marriage which was why there was an American researcher who predicted that there will be nothing called Nigeria, I think by 2015 or so. But however, uh, we, we are still together uh, uh, as a, a country, but with so much distrust among the people from the North, among the, uh, uh, between the people from the North and people from the South. So what actually is going on in this country is that the way the Northern people are seen, the Southern people differs from the way the Southern people are also seen the Northern people. So conflicts occur because of seeing things in part and pursuing apart. Most of them wrongdoers were remoralized in our colonial days where they make mistakes if they want to remain in the community. However, recalcitrant offenders then were sometimes banished or ostracized along with their own family members from the community. But when the uh, colonial masters came, they received English jurisprudence, abrogated this traditional system of peacemaking and then dealing with the recalcitrant, uh, recalcitrant offender by sending them out of the community. They received English jurisprudence, abrogated this system, which they thought were repugnant to national justice, and introduced the English law and jurisprudence, which we have been practicing since 1914. Next slide, please, Rob. So in contemporary Nigeria, we have the criminal code, and the penal codes, among other laws. Yet, justice is eluding humanity. And you see, just to emphasize the difference that existed even by, uh, uh, with the amalgamation, the criminal codes is only applicable in the southern part of Nigeria, and the penal codes is applicable only in the northern part of Nigeria. So, in the northern part of Nigeria, some Offenses are not recognized as criminal offense. 
Meanwhile, in the southern part, in the penal code, meanwhile, in the southern part of Nigeria, there are some offenses that are not recognized as criminal offenses in the penal code that are recognized as criminal offenses in the uh, uh, criminal code in the southern part of Nigeria. So the laws, even in Nigeria, uh, still disagree among themselves uh, along the line of um, the amalgamation or southern and northern protectorate uh, dichotomy as well. Um, this, to, the, to, to a very large extent, northern people want to operate their own laws. And that's why they are agitating for Sharia law. Because the northern protectorate before the coming of the colonial masters were mainly being managed or influenced by the Arabians. Because the Arabians come to do business with them through uh, the, the, the Shahel and in Mali, Niger, Chad, down to that area under Musa Mansa. Musa Mansa was a very big business tycoon around that time. So, who influenced the tradition, business, doing religion, and so on in the northern part of Nigeria. Why the southern part of Nigeria is influenced by? Portuguese, uh, the English speaking people, uh, uh, and Christians, and all of that. So, the, the, that, that dichotomy is there. And the Northern people want Nigeria to apply Sharia law, which the Southern people will never accept. So, to some extent, Sharia law is very, very influential and strong in the northern part of Nigeria, that it even displays a conventional criminal justice system. So because of this dichotomy, most people now are now beginning to say that uh, there is the need to look inward to adopt or adapt community tradition that will help heal the wounds of crime and conflict. So that the way the conventional criminal justice system is modeling things up, and causing more confusion, they said there is the need for people to revisit their own tradition if you want to uh, uh, peacemaking and uh, healing of wounds and crime. And hence, the work of uh, Mark Twain argues that restorative justice are customary relevant because laws are sound, but customs are rock. Law can be evaded and punish, punishment uh, escaped. But an openly transgressed custom brings sure punishment of moral gates. So the way people are escaped is because of who they know, who is in power, who can influence the judges and the, and the police and so on. And making traditional people in rural communities in most parts of Nigeria here beginning to see a huge Ill illegitimacy on the way the, the conventional criminal justice system is being applied. Next slide, please. So at the end of this seminar, what I'm trying to do is that we will be able to understand why the concept of restorative justice and its principles are appealing to many Nigerians and Africans. And we also understand why restorative justice is seen as a holistic justice, a justice system that's not merely seeking for facts and evidence, but the truth. And to also understand the relevance of restorative justice to African indigenous laws and traditions. Next slide, please. So I, I want to conceptualize justice in the eyes of restorative justice. So to me, justice is an acronym that encompasses holistic justice. And that's why I believe that the J in justice stands for jurisprudence. The U in justice stands for unity. The S in justice stands for security, 
The T in justice stands for trust. The I in justice stands for integrity. The C in justice stands for care. And the E in justice stands for equity. To be honest with you, the way the conventional criminal justice system is practiced in Nigeria here is um, it's very strong over reliance on jurisprudence, obscuring unity, even the security of both victims and offenders, the trust, the integrity, care and equity are to very large extent not very, very uh, which is very unfortunate. And that creates a lot of uh, legitimacy crisis on our conventional criminal justice system. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, theories of restorative justice that are very, very um, interesting to most Africans because they seem to talk to the minds of Africans as to what they believe justice system should look like. Uh, includes that of victim participation in the justice process because it gives the victims voice and victims' voices are strongly advocated in restorative justice. In traditional African communities, when crime occur, both victims and offender come before the committee of elders to explain and, and uh, discuss how the crime occur or how the wrong, uh, wrong uh, doing happens. And before they do that, uh, traditional elders make them um, take an oath or kind of a vow that whatever they are going to say is the truth and nothing but the truth. So people don't really, to a very large extent, lie against themselves because they believe that there is a supernatural being which they swore to who is monitoring and listening to whatever they are saying. So to a very large extent, they tell the truth. They don't lie against uh, their opponents. Then now that theory that tries to explain why most Africans, uh, especially Nigerians, are in support of um, restorative justice approach to justice, uh, criminal justice is the failure of the criminal justice system to even reform offenders. See. This theory by Barnett, Nick Christine, and English see restorative justice as an alternative justice system because over reliance on imprisonment by the criminal justice system does not work. And deterrence does not even deter at all. Similarly, effective reformation cannot take place in prisons. And the criminal justice practice justice as it should be and not as it ought to be. Hence, restorative justice is advocating a situation whereby a child of nobody can get justice without knowing anybody. This is very, very significant to the advocate, to why people want a revisit to their own way of doing justice peacefully. Because sometimes justice in my country here depends on who can buy justice or who you know. So somebody who just wants to take your wife may just accuse you of maybe doing something illegally. Then the next thing they get the police and the police will just take you and they lock you up in prison. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, one month, maybe two months later, you see that same person who arranged for this offender a suspected offender to be locked up will now come and begin to uh, say he want to marry the woman because the husband is in prison. So the, the husband may not come back again. So he want to marry the woman, want to buy the land, want to buy the house, and so on and so forth. You know? And people are beginning to wonder, why should a justice system be used to deprive others or cause confusion in human society like this? So justice is the way it is practiced and used by our justice system here is very, very obnoxious. 
Next slide, please. Then our people, particularly the rural community people, actually believe in what Jay and Danvaness call changing lenses or the paradigm shifts. Because they are saying that the people who are in prison, who the law put in prison, are not actually the criminals. But the people who are put in prison are the poor, the poor people, the one who cannot buy justice. They are the one who goes to prison. Meanwhile, the big men, the politicians who are corrupt, who are, who are, who are embezzling uh, public funds, are going about, even with police escort, freely on our Nigerian roads. And nothing happens to them. So people are beginning to see that unless we are going to kill all of our supposed criminals or keep them shut up for life in prison, there's only one way to protect society from crime. And that is using the restorative justice uh, principles. And another theoretical proposition is that one, is that of reintegrative shaming that was proposed by John Braithwaite. That one also appealed to our people here because the traditional people believe that we should condemn the behavior of an offender and not the person because stigmatizing the offender to, to some extent is not truly or really an offender, but because the law ma is manipulated, they take him to prison and by the time you come out of prison, they say, ah, he's an ex-offender, he's an ex-offender. That push that person back into life of real criminality. So stigmatization of somebody who comes out of prison breeds uh, more criminality in our society here to the extent that some of them, because they did not even commit crime before going into prison, when they come out of prison, they become more violent to the society than they were before they went into prison. I am saying this with all authority because I worked with the Nigerian prison as a prison officer and I've seen how our justice system works here. And uh, very, very unfortunate. Next slide, please. Then something that is closely related to the decolonization agenda or discourse that we are having today is the recognition of indigenous law, which Petite and Braithwaite also proposed in 1919, one of their jobs. This theory advocates the need for recognition of people's law instead of the ruler's law. Because the, the law, honestly, the criminal justice system as we are practicing in Nigeria is purely the ruler's law. It does not, um, recognize the people's law at all. Somebody who is in authority direct police to go and make arrests, they direct the judges on what to do, they direct the, 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 the judicial system on what kind of uh, um, outcome the, the, the court proceeding to, to, to should be. So they are using the law to their own selfish interest. So it is not rule of law at all but rule by law. So people are really not happy with that. And that's why they are advocating that there is a need for recognition of the people's law instead of the ruler's law. Then the communitarian thesis is also very, very significant to our conversation today, um, which uh, fatigued and uh, even the social theory of trust by Dove. These thesis argue that a society is doomed where people obey the law because they fear the law and not as a matter of conscience. In traditional African communities up to date, people are very, very careful in violating others, whether police are present or not, because they believe implicitly that there is a su supreme being that controls their own destiny. And that if they do otherwise, it will backfire on them. So they are always being guided. I tell you with all sincerity that crime is very high in upper cities in Nigeria. 
But in rural communities, people still leave their door unlocked and they go to farm, go to streams, and nobody gets into their houses to, to steal anything. But in urban cities, ah, you can't try that. Even when you have gates and so on, people still break the door and get in. So what that, the kind of belief system that controls crime and regulates criminality in the rural society and communities is what so many people are saying. Why can't we try to re-energize that in the mind of our youth who are even uh, growing up today? Next slide, please. You see, this is a metaphorical case study of conflict. In this, this one is claiming this is six, another one is claiming this is nine. To be honest, among these two people, the person who knows the right is among them. But if you take this case to a judge, uh, or to lawyers in Nigeria here, they will support both parties and say, oh, let's go to court. Let's go to court, you win the case. Another one, let's go to court, you win the case. But in traditional Africa, this issue can easily be resolved by calling the two parties, tell us the truth. Who is the rightful owner of this? And among themselves, they say, Tough. I don't want God to punish me. I don't want the supreme being or whatever they believe to punish them. The truth is that this person is the rightful owner. And the case will be settled there. But if this case is brought before a conventional uh, criminal justice practitioners, the case will drag on and drag on and drag on. And if there is not taken, the wrongful uh, owner will claim these objects. And then the rightful owner will be surprised. Why should the justice system support so, uh, injustice? Next slide, please. So is restorative justice principles new to African indigenous law? The answer is no from all our conversations so far. We can see this in the principle in the Ubuntu philosophy, where we say mutu, mutu, gambantu. That is, this thing was popularized by Brenda Fawcett. And mutu, mutu, gambantu is a philosophy of Ubuntu that say, I am because you are, and you are because I am. And so people who believe in this principle, they don't, they don't violate each other because they believe that even if we are different, we are all human. So I am because you are, and you are because I am. And this moderates their relationship. But I tell you, it's very, this, this principle is very, very strong in rural communities. But in urban cities, oh, you see people defrauding themselves. You want to do business transaction with even your own brother. You pretend to be good, you collect your money, and will not do the business for you. Very unfortunate. And again, there is a testimony of Sir James Marshall who was a director of the 19th century Royal Nanja Company, who later became the first chief justice of the West Coast of Africa, now Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, etc. If you see the testimony of Sir James Marshall to the Queen of England in those days, you will find out that he even advocated that the colonial master should try to encourage us to do the justice the way we are doing, and then probably um, embellish it. But to some extent, it never works. His testimony, the testimony of Sir James Marshall, as to the efficiency with which the natives administer their own laws is very striking. He has sat beside native judges and witnessed with admiration the administration of justice. These people have their own laws and customs, which are better adapted to their condition than the complicated system of English jurisprudence. The adoption of them would, it is maintained, be more conducive to the best interests of all than the present system. 
if you check this out, London Times of July 17, 1886. Some of you can, can check this out in the archive. You will get this quotation exactly. It was also cited by a late uh, Supreme Court judge, Justice Bellon, 1975, in his work, African Indigenous Law, page 33, which I also reference in my own work in 2020, page 28. Next slide, please. So the benefits of the restorative justice principle to African tradition, very, very imperative. Because one important aspect of the restorative justice uh, practice is the Janus, is that restorative justice is a Janus justice. That is a justice system that see from uh, the future and also uh, look at our history. Because it is a justice system that try to look at moral recognition of offenders who have been morally corrupted and bring them to begin to cognitively reconnect to the moral ethics and values of their own people. Because like I said, the conventional criminal justice system is all about what are the evidence, what are the facts before the law. But restorative justice principle is seeking, please tell us the truth. Please tell us the truth. So this moral reconnection therapy is imperative to offenders' resistance because the impasse in our contemporary sociopolitical culture is the conflict between two traditions of democratic thoughts. Next slide, please. Western democratic tradition has argued that morality should be private as against African tradition that regards morality as a societal virtue. This has caused conflict in the minds of modern youths who hardly distinguish issues between what is morality and what is freedom or what is human rights. Honestly, this is why today, when youths go to commit crime and they have money, they go get a lawyer. As far as they are concerned, with a good lawyer and with money, they are going to win the case. So they throw away morality. So they get into criminality, make quick money, get lawyers, stand by, and they call them my family lawyer, my family lawyer. The family lawyer who knows well that this guy is a criminal. But because the guy has made quick money through fraud, uh, fraudulent means duping people and so on, the lawyer will making money from him without even telling him the truth that what he's doing is right or not. So it's very, very unfortunate. So restorative justice philosophy is deeply concerned with this development. Because if we allow this to continue, time will come when a child of our neighbor, who is not our business, will affect our business. And exactly, sir, we have started seeing that in this country. Because somebody is doing something evil, you said, what is your business? Because he's not your child, is also what is your business? They are beginning, what well, some people will say, what is our business are beginning to affect our business today. You're traveling on a road, you see a group of uh, young men say, stop. Because they want money. They start robbing. You see so many of them joining terrorism because they think they can make quick money from there. You see so many of them doing dubious uh, uh, acts because they want to make quick money. And people are no longer talking to the youth. I want to give a typical example. When I was growing up, <clears throat> as a young man, going to school, we used to trek some uh, miles before we go to primary school, because primary school very scared, and there's not so many uh, during our time in the early uh, 70s. And I was dressed with my school uniform, then close to, I saw a mango tree, and I stopped plugging the mango tree, and that was around probably 9 or 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. So a farmer saw me with school uniform and believed that at this time I was supposed to be in school. So what was I doing on uh, that mango tree, plugging mango tree? He, he just got a cane, gave a thorough beating, gave me a thorough beating and dragged me like that down to the school headmaster. When I went to school, I was told to do what they call pin up. 
you have one finger on the on the floor and the one leg up like that. And I'm telling you, that changed my attitude. If not, I would have been uh, maybe a deviant today, but today I am a professor. And the man is not my father, but somebody who saw me that wearing school uniform, I'm supposed to be in school at that time. But today, if you try to do that to anybody's child now in Nigeria, they will get the police for you. That's why are you abusing the fundamental right of my child and this and that. So kids are misbehaving anyhow now in this country, which is very, very bad. Next slide, please. So following the above organic reality, people around Africa are now beginning to argue that there is the need to restructure the rule of law by allowing the justice of the people to bubble up, to reshape the justice of the law, so that the justice of the law will be more legitimately constrained to the justice of the people. So even if we want to do criminal justice, we should at least, as received from the uh, our colonial master, we should try in a way to build in the people's way of thinking in the justice process. It makes, it will make the justice system, the, the people will now see legitimacy in the justice system. But the way it is now, and um, people see it as, as it, is their, it is their way of doing things. It is their own justice, not our own justice. Next slide, please. So I want to conclude by saying that the burden of legitimacy crisis in the Nigerian criminal justice system is often bore by the poor in Nigeria who cannot buy justice or pay for justice. The system has created monsters in Africa. In our democratic experiment, for instance, politicians will openly rig elections and tell people who are aggrieved to go to court, where judgments are dispensed through telephone calls. Because they know if you like, go to court, <laughs> nothing will happen. So they will come, they will do something with impunity, and then tell you, go to court. <laughs> because they are the one controlling the court system. Political leaders who swore to oath of allegiance will take up political offices only to loot the people's treasury dry. And during the time when they want to be sworn in, they will hold Bible or they will hold Quran and say, I swear, I do solemnly swear this and that. By the time they get there, they abandon the oath of allegiance, and then begin to loot money, loot money with impunity. Yet the law protects them, and the poor watch these people with disdain. And they say, you see, take them to court. No way. We have an uh, anti-corruption commi co commission here. We have all kinds of laws here, but they are all operating nominally. Because even the people who are heading this system are appointed by the politicians themselves to protect their own. So it's very, very sad. But if it was a traditional community, honestly, when they tell you swear to an oath before you give a testimony, you will just be careful of the testimony you want to give because you believe that there is a supernatural being. I don't know. That hovers around them and they will never lie. And though for those who try to lie, there is a way. But people, all this uh, a traditional oath like Okute, Shungo, or Batala can op op operate and, and they start making confessions that they are sorry. The, the last time they make this statement, they lied. And that is why they are having this, uh, the consequences is coming upon them. They, they want the people to forgive them. And then maybe they, they go to the uh, Council of Elders. Then the Council of Elders will uh, do some abolition or rituals to try to cleanse them. Though in the, our religion now, Christianity and Islam, does not allow this to happen in big cities. But in traditional communities where these are happening, there's a, a, a little bit, I think, of peace and tranquility than in the big cities. 
And John, I need to ask you to stop at this point, please. Yes, I'll finish. So hence Africa need a justice system that is demoralized. Thank Indeed. you very much for listening. And thank, and you, very thank you very much for such a full and rich presentation. Um, you've offered perspectives that we haven't uh, been able to consider before. Um, and the idea of moralizing justice, you've also made me think that uh, to some extent we're all colonized, aren't we? Even privileged white people like myself, and uh, Dennis has owned himself in a similar identity, everyone is colonized by the um, by the professions. The state and the professions begin to, as Niels Christie used to say when he talked about thefts of conflict, that a crime is repackaged, framed in a different way, approached in a different way, and we are by the, in the interest of the professions, and we are all the poorer for it, because instead of concentrating on truth and concentrating on healing, they are concerned with other kind of processes, and they distort the human transaction, they distort the problem, uh, and they distort the solution. Um, I've let you down a bit as facilitator because uh, time is no longer on our side. I want to be sure that Juliana isn't, isn't under pressure. Does anybody have a quick observation before I ask her to take the, uh, take the floor? Okay, so thanks again, Don John. Juliana, um, I'd like if, uh, to ask you, if I may, to uh, to take uh, to start in a moment. Uh, thank you for your for your patience. Um, Juliana is um, a former director of the probation service in Romania, and she now works as a probation inspector in their national directorate. And she's on the board of CEP, the Confederation of European Probation. I have learned a lot from Juliana, and uh, having worked with her both in Romania and in Strasbourg where we've worked together from time to time with the Council of Europe. And uh, so I'm particularly pleased to welcome her and uh, over to you, Juliana. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you for, uh, for this invitation and thank you for these very kind words. Actually, uh, I have learned a lot from, uh, from you and your colleagues and uh, this is valid also for my colleagues team. I mean, now we have learned a lot from the international community. Uh, and actually, this is uh, somehow connected with uh, the topic of my uh, presentation today. Uh, how can a justice policy travel from uh, one point to, to another? And this was also the case for us in Romania. I know that uh, many people from the audience was uh, waiting for Professor Ioan Dmitry, but uh, I'm sorry to disappoint them. I cannot be one, and I'm not an academic, as Rob uh, explained earlier. Uh, but together with you, one uh, we have prepared uh, a presentation for uh, for you, and I will try to share my screen now. Okay, first to the presentation. Okay. Let's see. Can you see that? Okay, I cannot see anything now, so I need your, uh, uh, okay, if, if Rob, you can help me, tell me if you see my screen, because I can, I cannot see any of you now. Yeah? Can yes, we can see, we, we can see that. Super, super, uh, super, Rob, thank you for that. So, uh, while uh, uh, preparing the presentation uh, together with Professor Jan Dmescu, we were thinking what will be relevant for our discussion today. And uh, uh, for, uh, for this purpose, uh, we, uh, we were thinking to stop for, uh, for the introduction uh, uh, on uh, the literature on this subject. And uh, of course, we were thinking to the very well-known uh, article of uh, Marshall Dalloway who learns what from whom, and actually this is also the title of our first section. But uh, we have stopped also to the work of Professor Kenton uh, about uh, how we are taking probation abroad, and also to some uh, reviews of the work of Martian uh, uh, uh You will see that later on. Also, uh, we were thinking that it's good to make the connection with the practice, and we have identified the way how some criminal justice policies can uh, 
levels from one point to another here in Europe, so we're not focusing uh, to, to Europe. And um, in the second part of our presentation, we, uh, we will uh, explain some more promising and not some so promising examples in our uh, uh, region for policy transfer. And in the end, uh, we will uh, reflect uh, how uh, the future uh, looks like in, uh, uh, for, uh, for us in this field. So um, uh, we uh, we have to start from the idea that um, uh, in the case of criminal justice uh, policy transfer, we are talking about a similar process as in other types of, uh, of policy. So here we are talking that knowledge, administrative arrangements, institutions are uh, used from one time and one place to uh, uh, develop policy and administrative arrangement and institution in another time and another place. And uh, um, this is based on uh, uh, the article of Dolovic and, and Marsh, as you can see on, uh, on my screen. And uh, evidently this knowledge, administrative arrangement, institution, uh, travels with uh, someone's support. And this can be politicians or uh, civil servants like me or pressure groups or experts or supranational institutions. If we are talking about Europe, we can have uh, into account uh, the Council of Europe and Rob uh, mentioned that we work together in, uh, in Strasbourg for the uh, Council of Europe. They have the power to uh, uh, to set the, the standard and um, uh, is uh, also the case for uh, uh, it's also the case for the European uh, European Union. And um, uh, if uh, we are talking about the type of uh, of transfer, we can have in view the voluntary transfer when uh, the political actors uh, feel the dissatisfaction uh, of their uh, current state of affairs. But also we can talk about a coercive transfer. When some government, uh, government or supranational institutions can put some pressures on other governments to adjust the policy or the administrative arrangements for the institution. Uh, we we have agreed already that we can transfer policy, but we can transfer also policy goals. And to, we, if we are uh, taking into account the, uh, the goals in the criminal justice, we have transferred already uh, the goals uh, uh, regarding the uh, prison population, to decrease the prison population in, in our country. We have standards about uh, um, the conditions in, in prison, and these goals are reflected in our national policy here in the country members of the Council of Europe. It is the same with uh, the goal to reduce the, the real family, reducing the real family. We can transfer also content. And uh, here we can talk about laws, regulations, procedures. But uh, from our experience here in, uh, uh, in the Eastern Europe, we can transfer even institutions. And uh, institutions and uh, probation service is actually an example in, uh, in this respect. Also, victim support services or um, something new uh, related to asset uh, recovery body. So um, uh, instruments can be also uh, transferred from one jurisdiction to, to another. And we, if you are thinking only to the risk assessment tools or intervention programs for, uh, for offenders, evidently these are uh, very good examples. Um, this can be uh, this process of transfer can be facilitated by the same group of people we have um, uh, explained earlier. But um, in our view, there are um, uh, uh, key factors as explained uh, in the work of uh, Dolovic and uh, Marsh, but also you know, in the work of uh, Professor Kenton. And um, you can see uh, here uh, in the screen. Uh, uh, the key factors, but also um, uh, the metaphor I, I like a lot is the metaphor of uh, Professor Kenton, and not only because uh, 
probably scared today with, with that. It's uh, a metaphor I use in many presentations I'm uh, preparing on, uh, on the subject. So um, some key factors are related to the past and uh, with the history. Uh, the history related uh, to the organization and the country. And we have seen uh, something related to this topic in the previous two, two presentations. Um, one, another key factor is related to the institutional setting, political, uh, or about the technology and the research. And also is related to the public opinion, what the people want. And uh, it was uh, very uh, well emphasized by the previous speaker. Um, in, in our view, uh, uh, will be critical to identify the best strategy. And also from the literature, we know that we have various uh, uh, strategies for transfer policy and knowledge from one point to another. We can copy or we can use uh, strategy to emulate the, uh, the content or the policy. We have the hybridization. Uh, or the uh, synthesis, and why not the inspiration? So let's see. And Mediterranean flat and the garden. We know that Romania is not at the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, I have to buy a special soil when I have to transplant the lavender in my garden. And I'm always uh, thinking, uh, should I buy lavender this time or should I uh, buy something else? But from my experience, at least, of course, my subjective experience, lavender is always in, in, my, uh, in my garden. And uh, this, I think, we should have in mind when uh, we are planning to transfer uh, lessons and knowledge from one, uh, one point to, to another. There are also some limitations, and as uh, James Oliver and Lord Martin have explained in their work, um, in this uh, uh, transfer process, and especially how we can measure the transfer process. How do we know that this transfer process is at the end. And looking into the practice from the literature, we can, because we are sure that policies and ideas and attitudes uh, travel, uh, there are some avenues we call avenues of uh, policy transfer. And uh, we have extracted here only four, uh, according with our uh, knowledge in, uh, here in Europe and especially in uh, Eastern Europe. Definitely. Uh, policy, criminal policy travel uh, by bilateral regional agreement. Uh, and uh, because this is about language and history, and there is a, a context as a facilitator. Also, uh, we can have the international political agreement. And if you are talking about the EU accession process, um, I can uh, assure you that all the countries being in this the accession process are transferring some um, tools and some policies and developing some laws in order to meet some standards according with the international political agreement they made. Evidently, we are coming back to the supranational institutions, uh, and this is Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights, because they have the power to set Standards, uh, standards in the criminal justice, in the non custodial sanctions and measures, if we are talking about probation, regarding prison. And um, they have also the power to monitor if the countries are uh, complying with the standard. And this is also the case with the EU directive. So um, there, there is uh, an important avenue, the supra national institution. But also, uh, the knowledge uh, and the policies are uh, travel uh, thanks to the experts. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we have learned a lot from uh, Professor Kenton and his uh, colleagues from, from UK, thanks to different projects we have implemented 
here, and I know that other colleagues from, from the um, region uh, had the same experience. But I think this event we have today, it is also an example in this last category, because uh, knowledge can travel via the um, professional network, such as SCPA or CEP, where I am a member in the board, or Europe's or INCJ. So students exchange programs, these are also an avenue for uh, uh, for transfer. Uh, we uh, we have tried here to, to have a snapshot of um, the promising and not so promising examples of uh, policy uh, transfer in criminal justice, and especially in the uh, probation. And you can see on on the left of the screen, uh, uh, let's say the promising one, and uh, on the right, not so promising uh, examples. And um, uh, we can think uh, while uh, going to, to this uh, slide, we can think to the um, uh, a metaphor of transatlantic plan. And uh, we can have also in view what uh, what was the best strategy here was uh, the copying, the emulation, or digitization. So uh, if we are talking about transferring laws and concepts, yes. This is uh, uh, a promising practice, and uh, at least in the country I observed, it was uh, done as an emulation. So uh, they didn't copy the entire content. They uh, uh, decided what is useful and uh, what is not useful, and also combined with civilization and being inspired by many models from other jurisdictions. Evidently, the implementation of uh, the Council of Europe standards in uh, uh, the EU member states, because we know there is a condition to become first uh, Council of Europe member and afterwards EU member. Um, this can be also a promising, uh, a promising uh, example. And it's actually related to the climate if we are thinking to uh, um, the metaphor of transplanting the, uh, the plant. It's, it is a right climate to, uh, to implement uh, the standards in a certain uh, jurisdiction when we are looking to uh, uh, to be compliant with uh, with a set of, uh, of standards. Uh, implementing directives in the area of system support, this is valid also for um, uh, the EU member states. Um, we can mention our example from here from Romania for uh, developing our risk assessment tool. So, um, we didn't embrace uh, the coping practices from other jurisdictions. We have developed our risk assessment tool with the support of our Canadian colleagues, but based on our soil, I would say, and based on our climate. Um, if we are looking to electronic monitoring in, in Croatia, yes, they use also hybridization of tools to implement this tool in their uh, jurisdiction using examples for, from um, uh, more than one jurisdiction thanks to a uh, European project they have implemented there. If we are uh, moving to, to the right slide, we can uh, right to a part, we can see that um, we, uh, we have not so promising examples because sometimes we have to uh, transfer some concepts with, without having the soil, let's say. So when we have uh, uh, introduce uh, probation in the legislation of my country, but also in the other countries in the region, there are, there are no institutions, uh, no institutional framework in place. We created afterwards, but it was first the law and not the soil, let's say. Um, in, in Bulgaria, we have seen that um, uh, when they had introduced the probation as a penalty cell, again, by using only one model and from from UK, it wasn't well received by uh, by uh, uh, the practitioners and also by the academic environment. We have seen overlapping of competencies. Again, we we didn't pay attention to the soil here in my country, but also in in Greece. Um, some strategy to copy the risk assessment tool Oasis from uh, UK. Um, we, uh, we have not seen, uh, Bulgaria and Czech Republic. But, um, also in other countries here in the region, we have seen the introduction of various tools just copied from other countries, but not integrated in a broader vision. 
about how offenders should be managed and how new crimes should be um, uh, prevented. What is the future? And uh, uh, just in a uh, in, in few, few words, uh, uh, we, uh, we think that uh, the role of supranational institutions such as the European Commission and the Council of Europe will continue to play a critical role because they have these two uh, areas of activity. Standard setting, yeah, putting pressure on, uh, uh, on the members and also the monitoring uh, branch. Uh, there are some, um, in, uh, in the last phase of time, we, we can notice um, some synergies between the major donors because uh, you know, the policy follow the money, so uh, uh, money evidently are a facilitator to, to transfer the policy. So the big donors are trying to work together, and we can see now uh, projects implemented together, European Commission, Council of Europe, or Norwegian Financial Mechanism, Council of Europe, so there are synergies. Uh, the, the people are putting the resources together. Um, Brexit. Yeah, well, it was touched a little bit uh, earlier, but um, yeah, it, it is a question mark if uh, UK will continue to be a borrower for other states. But nevertheless, probably this shouldn't be the case as uh, uh, as United Kingdom as a state. Probably the transfer will be made via export, via small um, uh, private companies. Um, because I mentioned earlier, the policies are following the money. There are new borrowers at the horizon because uh, there are new financial streams like the Norway grants, and uh, this, uh, these grants are very popular in, uh, uh, in seven countries, at least, regarding the uh, criminal justice um, institutions. So we are now looking also to the Nordic countries, but we are always aware about the local context. Um, last but not least about universities and technology. Again, this example today, it is um, uh, connected with uh, our prediction to, to the future. Uh, this, uh, this event is organized by uh, Demonfort University and is organized by Azum. So definitely these two will, uh, will work together for a while. And the new normal, whatever this new normal will be, will, will, uh, will include this, uh, this key sector and uh, especially the, the technology. I think this is all. I don't know, Rob, if I respect the time. Thank you. This is a landing. I don't know where. Thank you so much, okay. Juliana. So as before, may I invite uh, comments and reflections and questions uh, from the panel? Anyone have a point that they'd like to make? I've got one uh, and it's this, Juliana. Is there a risk if we talk about policy transfer that that begins to be an act almost of colonization. The word transfer implies that we have something that is complete and we know what it is and we give it to you and you go ahead and you introduce it. And I'm although I've used the expression myself a lot over the years, I'm wondering whether knowledge exchange doesn't represent a, a better way of looking at it. So in that spirit, you would go to another country and say, well, here are our experiences. What are your experiences? Uh, because that, in that way, you can ensure that mutuality and the respect for local traditions. Because I've seen bad policy transfer, and I'm sure you have as well, where people have said, you want to know how to do it? Do it like we do it, without any regard to, to, to local context. Well, Rob, this is uh, a difficult question, of course, because it's uh, connected with uh, the capabilities of the, the, state, the lending state. Uh, how critical it can be and how uh, uh, much access we have to other uh, information. Now, of course, it, it is easier 
uh, in, in this era to use the technology, we can have uh, access to the information in a bit. But uh, uh, until few years ago, to, to be in contact with you like we are today, it was a privilege I couldn't imagine. So uh, yes, this can be uh, a successful approach and uh, at least in the jurisdiction I uh, I visited, and in my jurisdiction, this is the new trend. So first is to encourage a win-win uh, communication, and afterwards to to decide what is fitted in your soil, if is fitted or is not. So um, it, it is a matter of uh, the the one requesting. Uh, the transfer of a particular policy or a particular tool. How um, prepared they are for this process, how informed, how connected. Uh, it is a whole of discussion here, but I think this is, uh, this is the key is to have uh, uh, emulation or stabilization uh, if you are talking in the language of uh, martial law. So it's maybe a limitation of the plant metaphor, isn't it? Because yeah. you know if you know if a plant is succeeding, I mean, if it perishes, then it's unsuccessful. But you're not trying to take, for example, English probation and plant it in Bulgaria. What you're trying to do, I think, is to enable Bulgarian probation to to, to thrive and to prosper. And you also need to be sure, I guess, that you don't end up with something like uh, not weed. <laughs> which becomes invasive and infestive and takes over all your own, which is just what Don John described, really. That's the colonial aspect, isn't it? So you take something across and it proceeds to suppress and um, impoverish the local environment, as suppressing other other um, more indigenous uh, fruits. Yeah, it is about all the actors involved. I mean, uh, we have to be uh, genuine when discussing about uh, this policy transfer subject. Both, uh, all the parties involved should be genuine about it. Definitely. Um, colleagues, friends, we've only got a couple more minutes. There's just one, if anyone, Dennis, you've got a hand up. Um, what would you like to say, please? Yeah, I, um, one of the things I've noticed um, and and I appreciate uh, both Uliana and and Don John's um, presentations. W one of the things I've noticed in in terms of policy transfer is, and and this actually ties into Dave's comment earlier about the exotic, is that is that there are times when we look uh, abroad and see something that looks exotic to us, and we try and transplant it. Um, uh, you know, take the lilac, if I can use Juliana's favorite plant, and we, we try and plant it in, in soil that just doesn't work. And one of the examples I can think of is, is the family group conferencing model that grew out of New Zealand with respect to young offenders. There was lots of discussion as to whether or not, in fact, that was a Maori tradition or was that uh, an Australian Aboriginal tradition? And can't we just graft that on to um, Canadian Indigenous traditions? Um, and I and I don't know the final, the, you know, where it actually did come from. I've heard conflicting reports as well. It was really Australian, and then it went to New Zealand, or it was actually New Zealand all along. I don't think that matters. I mean, the point is that there was an attempt to just sort of drop that into uh, Canadian uh, youth justice, and it it didn't actually take off. In some places, it seemed to work for a short period of time. Um, and but we called it something else. It was called community justice forums or something like that. Um, but I, I, I guess I, I'm I'm a little concerned that sometimes we we see these things, and this is kind of a reverse of what Don John was talking about. Instead of taking the the colonial system and 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 imposing it on the colonized, now we seem to be doing the opposite, and we're saying let's take the colonized ideas and let's try and graft them onto the colonial structures. And sometimes they work, but often they don't. Um, and, and I'm trying not to be a downer here, but I just think we need to be really cautious about sometimes this apparently exotic transfer. I'll stop there and let other people talk. Thank you for that observation, Dennis. Um, Abdul, we have almost no time at all, but please make your point. I think it may have to be the very last one. No, I'll try to make it very brief. And, and thank you, Luliana and um, 
Don John for really interesting sort of presentations. And I, I was kind of reflecting there on power structures and, and what do you do when sort of values uh, clash? Um, so Don John was talking about sort of the, what I so, sort of understood in terms of clash between African law, Sharia law, and sort of law from the colonial times. Uh, uh, and yet, Don John, you were sort of, I think, suggesting that going back to sort of traditional African law um, might seem to provide an answer. Uh, and yet, as you described in the North with Sharia law, many, very many feel, people would feel very uncomfortable about the moral aspects of Sharia law from, you know, certain Western people would being implemented. Um, it's a shame um, <laughs> we're coming towards the end, but it, it kind of also talks to, I think, around what the metaphor, uh, uh, Luliana, you were talking about, about the plant structure and how do you allow it to flourish when those and whose technological skills uh, have made this possible. We wouldn't be doing this without him. So thank you all ever so much. Um, and I look forward to further correspondence and meetings with you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Everyone, bye bye. 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 You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network. <laughs>